Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar entitled Leveraging AI, Omnichannel Commerce and Personalized Experiences brought to you by Just IS. My name is Melanie Frank and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Uh, in this session, our speakers will cover all of the exciting possibilities of AI in the retail space. Uh, they'll answer why it matters and how retailers can truly benefit uh, from leveraging it. So please note that we will open up a Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, so if you wanted to, please go ahead and put your questions down in the chat and we will try and get to as many as possible. Uh, so let's start off today with a brief introduction. Um, today's speakers are Scott Pearson, VP of Sales and Marketing at Just IS, and we also have Alex Obike. He is the CEO of Crossing Minds. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. So perhaps um, let's start off with each of you giving a brief introduction of your personal background, along with um, an overview quickly of Just uh, and Crossing Minds, and maybe give us a little insight into why these two companies have joined forces. I guess we'll start with uh, with Alex. Um, well, thank you very much, Melanie and Scott, for having us in this webinar today. Um, on our hand, this is actually very interesting. We have, we've been working on recommendation system, personalization, uh, and human behavior prediction for almost 10 years now. And one of the aspects uh, and one of the strengths of the company, uh, Crossing Minds, hence the name, was to leverage all the insights and information that we have about one customer's behaviors across numerous touch points. And it could be the online, the emails, the, the, the physical store, everything that's like where we had the chance to interact with them. And it was very complicated for us to take care of the same time of the AI and the platform themselves. And we saw in Gesta a uniquely um, equipped team and product and platform that was taking care of customers, not only um in online but also with the physical store with the merchandising uh everything that was so important for us to capture and we were like that's the perfect let's say opportunity and company for us to partner with and build technology together because they have the touch points we have the tech, we have the ai uh, to make sense of all those data and this is where we are today so very very excited again to be on this call very excited to be working with scott and the rest of the just is team and i think that's uh, that's it for us Great. Scott? I'm Scott Pearson, uh, Head of Sales and Marketing for Jesta, but I, I come with a history of both the retail side of the industry as well as the retail technology side of the industry and various roles focused on you know, product, but you know, really focused on supply chain management, in-store technologies, uh, and then you know, sort of this kind of concept of unification of, of channels as things have changed over time and continue to change. Uh, we started getting into really how do we leverage AI across channels, uh, which opened up a lot of conversations. And then how do we take what used to be in-store domain is now becoming probably more online domain as to the expertise as to what's engaging or how is a customer is engaging outside of the brand and then combine them to really kind of unify everything. And that's kind of why we started down this path and, and where most of these conversations are going to end up going. Super. That's great. Okay. Thank you both. So we're just going to jump right in. So let me just click to our next slide. So I think, Scott, I'm just going to ask you this question. Uh, let's start off by actually, maybe you can give us an overview of what is omni-channel. And then let's jump into how can AI improve a brand's omni-channel personalization? I guess I alluded to this a little bit earlier when Alex and I first started talking. We were, we were talking about the context of, you know, omni-channel. I realized very early on in our conversation that we were actually coming from two different lenses. Yeah. Uh, a traditional retail environment, a bricks and mortar store, thinks about online e-commerce as being the omni-channel, um, the, the second channel anyway. Uh, and the perspective is oftentimes focused on you know, how the store associate interacts with the customer, but then we need to try to mirror some of those capabilities online. When I was talking to Alex, it was it was clear that you know they're coming more from the digital commerce e-commerce side to say, great, we have all these great tools that are that we've been developing over years now. How do we implement those tools down to the store so that the store employees and and people within the store, whether it's an employee or the consumer shopping on their own uh, device, uh, kiosk, whatever that might be, how do we actually start to incorporate that in the store? So it was it was kind of funny 
when we talked about omni-channel because we came from two different views. But I think that the end goal ultimately really is not omni-channel, but unified commerce. And I think that's maybe a, a better term for what we're trying to drive at here. I couldn't agree more. It's um, for, for, for us, so from the digital perspective, the omni-channel aspect of things was really about all the different touch points and all the different, let's say, moments in the customer journey where we could actually impact the experience by either uh, remembering or simply unifying all those points. And this is why, to Scott's point, the unified business approach is definitely a bit of better term. But for us, it was really, okay, we have this great tech. How could it be, certainly not replace, but but integrate and, and, and enhance the customer experience in physical store by being at the checkout uh, kiosk or by being uh, in the hand of the customer support person in the store or all those kind of things. And and and, and just as a unique platform that allow us to do that nowadays. And this is why I, uh, the Omni channel for us was like all those little touch points that we never could dream of accessing until someone has built a unified platform. And this is why, again, to this point, unified business and commerce is probably a better term when it comes to Omni channel personalization. It's, it's just remembering the customer with the global intelligence and only first party data right like this is something that's not that's remain gdpr and SOC 2 compliant but this is just so powerful to unify all those touch points and this is the the, the beauty of just in this case and, and on the topic of the personalization piece specifically it's you know it goes well beyond just recommendations but you know online tools oftentimes are focused on the session that's going on and, and in some cases if you know more of the brands but it, it really is the unification of interactions that take place both in the store and online and that's how you really mm -hmm. start to personalize is understanding that unique customer at a level that you just wouldn't know uh, on any one single channel and i think some of our other conversations will focus a little bit more on that context of of really unifying their history and the nuances that are associated with the the level of history and the detail that you might have at the store is a little different than what you would have online but still keeping that experience the brand experience across all channels, um, unified and unique. Perfect. So uh, Alex, how does AI predict what a person wants and what are behavior-based suggestions? Well, it's, um, well, it's all in the title. AI doesn't necessarily predict, uh, interestingly, what a person, I mean, it does in a sense of, we're looking at the past interaction that someone has with a store, how much they interact with something, how long they say looking at it, how many times they click on it. What's very important is that the appreciation that every single of those signals are implicit feedback. It's not someone telling you explicitly, I like this product. It's someone telling you through their action and through their different nuances, how they feel about it. So the first thing, if you want to start doing personalization is just to appreciate that each person is unique and that a click for me and a click for Scott might not mean the same thing at all. So that's the first thing. Like mm -hmm. I might be a clicker and free click on everything that moves and Scott might just click and buy. And that has a significantly different weight. So personalization start by interpreting differently, user per user, what each of those feedback means. Once you have ingested that and start making sense of historically what happened with different contexts, with different situation, a physical store and online are also two different ecosystem that needs to be appreciated when you start making this kind of interpretation and then when someone come back on the website you have calculated in real time this is the likelihood that someone would like that those products and the recommendation is like calculating this likelihood and then reordering that by showing you the product that you have the highest likelihood to resonate with based on all those past interaction i had and you can put some weight on the fact that, hey, I want to focus on their recent interaction, and so you focus more on what just happened. You can put some weight on the context and the trends that you see in this society and, and elsewhere. You can put some trends on what you want to push yourself in terms of merchandising and business rules. But there's a lot of business rules that comes on top of that to make sure that you provide the best experience to the user and, mm -hmm. and what you want to optimize for. See, the home page of the website might be here for increasing the engagement. The, the cart might be to increase the average of the value. The in-store might be to help with the merchandising and just pushing stocks that you have at the counter, anything like that. But this is something that's also very contextual, not just regarding the customer, but regarding the touch point that you have with them. And just to offer such a variant of touch point that this is for us the candy. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a number of 
you know, different types of models, you know, affinity, somebody has an affinity to this, other people might like it, or propensity modeling. And then there's other things where customers similar to you like this, and therefore you may like that. All of these models are really intriguing and interesting, but they all serve different purposes. And Absolutely. that's one of the challenges I think we're faced with as in a store, a buying decision from a data perspective is very binary. I know they bought it or they didn't. I don't even know they looked at it. Uh, you know, they may have put it on their wish list, but I don't have the same level of information in the store as you have online, where I know what they looked at, what they clicked on, what they viewed, what they put in their basket and didn't buy. That's a level of detail that isn't available in stores today. It's um, so part of the question is how do we then combine you know, what's occurring in the store, which is binary, with what's occurring online, which gives you much more data, or how do I capture additional information related to this particular consumer so I can enhance the data that I would have available even within the store. Um, so for example, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, but things like style surveys give you insights into the types of products somebody likes, which then can be derived as a preference of sorts, uh, which works into some of these models. Well, you see, I love that again, that we, I hear that perspective from you on your, the just uh, uh, angle of things, because for me, um, I, I didn't thought of like, the fact that as a platform, you're right, you don't have those feedbacks in real life ingested into the system afterwards. And I was always thinking about the physical world as like a salesperson. And for me, a salesperson, if they're attentive and talented, they have a billion times more feedback. Like the, the someone looking at it, someone just looking at the ingredients, someone asking a question, someone citing, and someone just really looking at the price and raising their eyebrows. I was thinking of the, the individual itself, but you're right that that person has a billion in their head. Yeah. Uh, that never passed on to the system. So you're losing all this information, you just have the raw thing. So I was always trying to map the digital thing. We're missing so much things that if I was next to them and holding their hand, I would know. But you're right that, that most of the time you never actually capture properly those things or remember them for the models who to act on it. So I, hearing it from your perspective, is like, oh yeah, that's true. You know what? I was thinking like it would be so easy, but no, on a salesperson perspective, yes, but not on a platform perspective. Exactly, that's exactly right. That's really? that's the big challenge, and you know, of course, there are you know other tools out there and engagement tools that allow associates to identify more of that. Uh, and oh, my no. goal is to then have the associate interact with those tools that will allow yeah. for that data capture in a more simplified manner. But it's not yeah. you know traditional POS. POS is I rang a transaction or I didn't. <laughs> I yeah. put it on hold or layaway. Maybe that's not the only thing that was short of a purchase that I even knew about. Yeah. And that must be laborious to ask them to enter all those informations. But man, I would pay a ton of money to just see that that eyebrow lift when someone look at an ingredient or a price because that would tell me so much more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's complicated. So as you, you you both were talking, I kind of jumped ahead with the next slide, but um, I'll go ahead and ask the next question. I think Alex, you'll be the best one to to answer this one since you've incorporated the Chat GPT. So how can brands train chat gpt to sell their products and maybe you can give a little bit of background about the chat gpt in oh. in your offering yeah well the the idea is it's funny because my answer last night or two days ago would have been different than my answer today just because of release that uh opening i did uh okay. but um you chat gpt is one big model in the world and you you if you go on open ai and chat gpt and you ask them what's the best product to sell you cannot train that massive model that is used by everybody to just say, oh, this brand will be great for you. What you can do is use ChatGPT, so this large language model, this AI, and plug it into your store. And the, 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 the first thing that you could think of is like, I can have a chatbot or sales agent that would understand and sells my, my, my catalog. Until three, four days ago, that was not possible. Then I think yesterday or two days ago, OpenAI said, hey, finally, you have a feature on the API that allows you to train a model on your catalog so you can learn about it or learn a few things. But it's not enough because the thing that people forget about ChatGPT is that it does not have a memory of your interaction. So when you start talking with it, you write a first message, it gives you an answer. And what's super interesting is like you have an iterative process where you feel like, oh, but I can ask him to correct something or I can ask him to revise it. 
and that gives you the feeling that he would have in memory somewhere what just happened prior but that's not the case what happened is like every time when you write a message he need to summarize that first section and send it back as a complete new message by saying like hey by the way remember that's what happened that lack of memory makes it very difficult for it to one last a long time and you can see that over different interactions with the chat gpt uh, platform you lose accuracy in the answer because you can't remember everything that happened but it also won't remember if you reopen a new window that's that's you can't refer to what you just said in two weeks ago okay. that's, that's not gonna happen so in the case of selling you could train on your model but you need to have a model that's plugged with personalization or recommendation engine which would act as the memory and as the great knowledge of your catalog and the taste of the user and chat gpt would just interpret what the user is asking for like a salesperson would do in the store pass that on to the recommendations and say hey that person is looking for that and that name is bob i don't know who's bob i know who's bob bob did that before and this is what you should show them and then the chat gpt would pass on oh by the way bob i remember you or this or the API i remember you and pass that on okay. that's that's one thing. The other thing that you can do with ChatGPT is also improve significantly your catalog. And it's like increasing, let's say, cleaning of the tags, writing descriptions about the product, optimizing that for SEO, making sure that you have the right extraction from images. Tons and tons of things uh, that are not necessarily around the conversation, but are more about ingestion of raw text that the manufacturer can pass on. But that's, that's already a lot of information, so I'll give a pause here. Wow. Exciting stuff. It's, it's, it's intriguing because it's, it's, it it's, it's, it's a moving target, uh, obviously, to yeah. some degree, just because of new things being announced and how you easily train your data specifically. Exactly. How you incorporate feedback. You know, you can in chat GPT say, yeah, I like this or that or, or not. But how, if we're not recording those responses somewhere, how do we then you know, feed it back? So feeding it into recommendation and even feeding it into the database associated with uh, with the product recommendations that are appearing or the feedback uh, of the result set that's appearing uh, yeah. and and being able to build that into your subsequent model you know so it becomes more of a learning model of just by virtue of the actual model you're training against um you know i think there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity here for sure and and it's still you know, this is very nascent as part of a business right now but it's very also still blurry right like a lot of people are still figuring out we are still figuring it out like we know that it works for some massive brand that want to invest into the model, but you just like, I, I would, if someone asked me what's the best way to use generative AI today that would bring value to my business for sure, I would direct them towards the product data enrichment. I would say, you know what, that would save you a ton of time to clean up, to create new properties, to optimize for SEOs and tags and all the stuff, and we can help you set that up. The, the, the chat part of things, I would say, that has a huge potential but it's it's really something that's like an R&D project. Don't consider that as like an investment on the project, like something that, that, that's moving. These updates every single week, these updates. <laughs> so yeah, it's it. And, and that's even more interesting with a platform that has such breadth of, of capabilities as just uh, because you could see the application across many different centers that are mind blowing. And I, I actually, it's it's funny. I, the question really talks about training ChatGPT to sell, and and getting back into the context of our earlier part of the conversation. You know, in the store, it's the store associate that still does most of the selling. Yeah. So the question is, how do you get the store associate to engage with ChatGPT in a way to augment them? They are the ones that saw the eyebrows rise, and they you know they they understand yeah. what's going on, but. That the system can also provide some unique value. So I, I think over time, what we'll start to see is as your top store associates, and in luxury, this is highly the case, they know what to sell and they know what they want to recommend. And the system may make some recommendations they hadn't thought of, but maybe there's the opportunity to start to store their unique session um, so that they, as an individual store associate, are, are participating with the tool in a slightly different way than, than Alex would be participating with the tool because it's based on my the products that I like and the things that I wish to show. And I think that's where we're going to start to see it kind of morph in that direction as to how do you, how do you individualize those recommendations mm -hmm. from a store associate rather than having the model just focused entirely on the aggregate of the entire population. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a tree spot on. 
So I think I'm going to ask this one to you, Scott. So how can brands more effectively empower the sales associates with with the rich data and, and the insights? I'll look a little less on the on the chat GPT concept uh, to respond to this, I guess, more because you know data is everything. And the more rich the data can become, the more empowered you can be, mm -hmm. assuming you have access to that data. And as I mentioned earlier, as customer engagement tools are being leveraged more, being able to capture things like um, customers' preferences, likes, dislikes, wish lists, all of those things are important. Um, performing things like style surveys. So I know, uh, does, this, does this woman like boho chic? Uh, what type of fabrics does she like? Uh, what's the neckline uh, of the typical item or the silhouette? And as I start to learn that, if I have appropriately attributed my products uh, accordingly, uh, it gives me a ton of information. Attributes is kind of the key to a lot of this stuff is understanding not just the color size style and uh, that sort of stuff, but understanding all these other topics that are yet unknown, the types of materials, closures, you know, it could be a whole host of things. And as I start to know that about each product, then that becomes part of the conversation when I'm talking about using technologies like this to empower the store associate is to capture this information. And like I mentioned earlier, if it's a style survey or I send out a collection of products that the customer has responded to, uh, or I know what they purchased, uh, I now have a lot more information to ascertain, I guess, glean okay. what's likely coming from that data to really kind of create a persona for the individual. And it's based on that, that persona and or segment uh, that the store associate really becomes empowered. It's just having much more data and letting the system help them, uh, assist them and come up with these various personas, et cetera. And that, that's where they can really start to get really targeted in their approach. Absolutely. So I think this, your answer kind of leads into this, this next question here too. So how are retailers using the product recommendations to compete for customer loyalty? You mentioned empowering store associates and in-store kiosks. Would you like to expand a little bit in, more about the in-store personalization? And I guess I'll, I'll expand a little on the broader context. So I, I think in parallel to, you know, I mentioned earlier, sales associates were the expert. E-commerce came about and said, how do we mimic what salespeople are doing to some degree? And that's where a lot of the technologies that we're seeing today are in an attempt to mimic a more personalized one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship to the point now where I think because there is more information online uh, than there is in fact in the store that I think in many ways it's gotten better at it, at least recommendations, maybe not presenting and showing and you know helping to close the sale type of thing. But I think it got better to the point where people are going, oh, how do I bring some of that now back into the store? And I think that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. That being said, the customer journey has also been changing. Uh, the consumer used to go into the store on the weekends and they would shop and they would come out with bags of items and then occasionally they would buy online. And now the customer journey is very different. They start off, you know, do they even know who you are? Uh, so you need to really you know, understand the awareness component of it. And in addition to awareness, the consideration, are they considering buying it or not buying it? And then the decision-making phases. Many customers have been, made a decision before they even walk into the store. Mm -hmm. That's where I think these tools really need to evolved so they are interacting in all of those earlier phases before the transaction occurs. That may be social media, it may, may be online, it may be a, a whole host of things. It may be store associates engaging with the customer to get a style survey or send collections of products and again, recording all that information um, so that it's available now so I can really evolve and learn what's going on over time. So I, I think it really is in, in very large part a, a result or a response to the changing customer journey. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think this is a matter of being able to capture and nurture all those little data that are, let's say, sprinkled across the customer journey. It's 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 going to be quite complicated, but not impossible and very exciting, by the way, to, to be able to then give that back in something digestible that would empower either the customer directly or the sales associate. But it's really about being able to grasp all those little moments in the life of the customer journey, even way before they enter the store and, and, and try to unify that journey. That's the exact way that we discussed at the beginning of that call. But uh, it's um, I'm actually very curious to see that and the impact that it would have in the in-store kiosk and how people would mm -hmm. be excited about or enthusiastic. And I, I'm very excited also to see how those store associates would be able to leverage and, and, and to the limit of their abilities, of course, 
feed back some of the data that we might be missing and, and, and how diverse and how, let's say, yeah, uh, leverageable those insights would become. I, I would be curious to see how the in-store associates will embrace the new technology. We, I'm just wondering if if it's if it's something that they it, they would consider to be a, a hindrance on their their already uh, role. So I don't know. What, what do you think? think? If there's an initially going to be a resistance. Reluctance, think, you know, yeah. The Gen Y, the Gen Z are are more intrigued by technology, and it's become you know as they're playing with Chat GPT and other things, it's probably a little bit more intriguing to them. But there's definitely a resistance. That's why I was saying earlier. So I think yeah, as you as you learn to demonstrate to them that it's a way to augment their day-to-day -day. they don't know every product in the store some of your top salespeople, even in you know high-end luxury still don't know if the product's available elsewhere or can they get it somewhere else without having to go to some other system so there's a lot of things i think that that will address that but there will be a you know in some cases initially resistance there always is from a cultural change management perspective yeah so i think I you agree. can assume that that's true the gen z would be probably the most fervent adopters in that thing. But but for me, when I go to Sephora and I think of people that are doing internship in the summer and, and how their, their stores said like, there's no way you know the 15,000 SKUs you have in a store like that. That's right. When you're here for three months and someone asks you, hey, I have a dry skin, what should I put on there? And mm -hmm. you're just there for like six months. How on earth could you give an educated, accurate feedback on someone like that when you not know the store, but also don't necessarily know all the attributes of those products so for me that's a no-brainer that that will happen and 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 that's a no-brainer that the younger generation will be the first one to embrace it um due to their their their, their savviness but yeah that for me this is this has to happen and this is why when you think of when we think of this collaboration with just uh with just no matter of like who's going to be the first one to do it because that's going to be huge yeah and i will say they you know, there are there are certainly best practices as, as it relates to certain parts of our conversation today. Uh, but the reality of it is this is so early in the adoption curve and where things are going. And I think retailers need to be strategizing as to how, how do they think they want to tackle this and, and in what order and strategically, you know, like I mentioned before, it can be part of the early parts of the customer journey. They may not even be aware of your brand yet. You know, how do you leverage things like this to, to get awareness out there? as well as consideration and all those phases and then of course you know being a premium to your e-commerce and or bringing to the store and making sure that all that data is available really as a unified commerce platform yeah absolutely it's really great uh, both of you great insights on uh, how retailers can definitely improve uh, customer engagement and secure their loyalty and really grow um, as an operation. Um, I think we're going to open it up right now unless you both have something else to add. I think we'll open it up to some questions because I do have a couple of them. Um, and feel free either one of you to jump in to one of them. So let me, what advice, I think Scott you must have already touched a bit on this. It, it's funny it came up. What advice would you give retailers uh, that may be a bit hesitant to adopt uh, AI into their, their omni-channel operations? I, th I think particularly if you're doing it in store, and this is a challenge that retailers are often faced with and things that I've focused, you know, dedicated time and efforts on really the concept of cultural change management, making people aware of why why a challenge is there that we're trying to address. They need to buy into it. Um, mm -hmm. They need to make sure that they've trained and engaged with the associates, but more importantly, they the associates feel as though they're participating. And if you're showing them how to do their job a little bit more easily, how they're more effective, you know, all of those things come in. But like I said, it is a, it's strategic, both from a marketing perspective, from an in-store perspective, from a merchandising perspective. Quite frankly, we're, we're talking a lot about engagement around customer, um, but that information is also, can also be made available to the merchants. Mm -hmm. And think about your next buying decisions when you know that these people have been looking at these products, these are recommendations that came up, or these are the attributes that are selling the most. And it really helps you style your next product line your next assortment. So there's all kinds of rich information you can gather from this. So I think each retailer needs to identify where they see the lowest hanging fruit mm -hmm. and then come up with an actual strategy around it. Great answer. Okay, I have one more and uh, perhaps I guess I'll ask this one to, to Alex. What are the most important things every uh, retailer should know about using the recommendation 
platform? Um, well, everything is based on the quality of your data and the first part data that you have. And that's the mm -hmm. quality at the same time of your product catalog and making sure that they have the right attributes, that this is clean, that this is scalable, uh, and that you have the right tools in place to capture your customer behavior. And it's you don't need to go buy it somewhere else. You don't need to like use any third-party cookies or whatever. Like you remain compliant and use your first-party data. And you have so many sources, uh, especially with the tool like Gestal, um, online and in there to capture this first-party data. And so before thinking of any recommendation personalization, just make sure that you have those two things set up. And then after that, it's like really a matter of, as Scott mentioned, finding the right model, the right use case, focus on the right KPI, understand what, you're, what you want recommendation to do and, and enhance in terms of customer experience. And then after, after, once you get those bases covered, you can go and really tap onto the unified and omnichannel aspect of things. Mm -hmm. But first part that I, I will always repeat that, customer interaction with your store and a clean product catalog would make you ready for the craziest recommendation existing in the world. That's great. Okay, um, I think we have kind of overwent our, uh, we're about five minutes over our schedule. So you know what, I wanna thank both of you for um, participating. Thank you, Alex, thank you, Scott, and thank you for everybody who attended this webinar. If uh, anybody has any questions or wants to get in touch with either um, Scott or Alex, you can always just go on, our, on either one of the websites and go in to contact us or you can um, contact us directly uh, by phone. So I wanna thank you all very much. Uh, you'll all probably get a recording of this will be available shortly. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much.